If you're looking for better results on Google Maps or just Google in general, this video is for you. I'm talking with Google expert James Nesty, who's going to share a three part strategy that he used to help a client dominate Google Map results, dominate Google results. Let's dive in. As business owners, the challenges of marketing are ever present. We're always trying to get an edge, figure out the best digital marketing strategy to grow our business. And it helps to have someone who knows the ins and outs of the Google complex, ads, SEO, all that stuff. And so today I am delighted to be talking with James Nesty, who owns a digital marketing agency. And he's going to tell us about a success story that he had on a Google strategy for a client. Why don't you tell us a little bit about your company and what you do for clients? Thanks, Summer. Thanks for having me on. Excited to be a part of this and dive into the strategy and, you know, kind of give those nuggets of wisdom. A little bit about myself. First, as you already know, James Nesty, been in the digital marketing space for going on nine plus years now. You know, when I started Local Search Pros, it was more like, how could I take the mindset and what I know on Google and apply that to help other businesses grow? I worked a lot with agencies in the past and with actual individual companies in themselves, ranging from small mom and pop to regional, national, multinational companies. You know, I've had my hands in different ecosystems from really like taking that omni marketing channel thought process that's transcended from Amazon to, you know, Google to social media to resale. What I like to provide my customers is a lot of times I tell them, who are you working with? Are you working with an order taker or somebody that's there to give you strategy and give pushback and really be the expert that's going to help tell you what to do and help you actually make those meaningful steps to achieve your goals? The example was a bridal boutique that I work with in Atlanta and this gal for two years. And I tell her, I was like, Jordan, I wish all my customers were like you because it just seems like you were just paying them for two years, an SEO company, 1800 bucks a month. And before she came to me, she was like, James, I, I, they show me these reports. I see a bunch of traffic. But at the end of the day, it doesn't translate to people coming into my store to buy dresses. And what ended up happening with that is the, the strategy is inferior. Sure. Right? When we think of human nature, of like, well, these pathway of resistance you know, those individuals like, hey, you come to me and you ask for SEO versus if I'm the individual and I'm saying, hey, a lot of times if a client comes to me, I think like in layman's perspective, like a lot of times that individual is saying, hey, James, I want to get more leads. I know I could be getting more leads on Google. I know I'm deficient on Google. The popular term that I hear is SEO. Therefore, I must need SEO. And so where she fell into that trap is great. Like I, you know, found somebody that to do SEO and they're going to do SEO for me, but then you have to remind yourself, well, if that person's just being that order taker and going through the least pathway of resistance, like how are they going to treat that with the, how they do the work? And that's where she fell victim is a lot of the content they were writing for her was geared around nothing to do with buying dresses or nothing to actually like showcase her store locally and drive traffic locally. It was things to prepare for on a bridal shower, you know, stuff that had really kind of tangential to being going through a wedding and all that kind of stuff, but like not specific to the dress itself. So that's where, you know, made a big difference. And like where I help a lot of my clients is really to look at it. What is the strategy that's going to make you get the most outsized returns? Because one of the traps I also see people take is there's a lot of sex appeal in the busy work. And so a lot of times people fall victim of, Hey, these are the things that I'm told I'm supposed to do. Therefore I should be doing it. Or I hear that others are doing it. Therefore I should and then you have to remind yourself, what is the lost opportunity cost of your time? Or, you know, for example, I know a financial advisor and I hear this all the time. They're like, hey, this one example is paying this gal like 75, 80 grand a year to handle our social media. I mean, we got to talking. It's like, well, do you ever get any leads through social? And she's like, well, no. It's like, of course not. Because when it comes to that specific niche, if I'm someone that's looking to grow my investments and that want a good financial advisor because that's always like the caveat, right? I'm going to go to the person that has money and I'm going to go to that person and say, hey, who do you use? Because that's going to be my barometer of success. So like the likelihood of, hey, am I going to find an individual that can help me through actually through social media, <laughs> the likelihood of success is extremely limited. And so just even for her and that decision making, it then becomes, well, hey, you could save that cost, reinvest into other things. Or heck, even pivot that person to other things that's actually drive more value. And a lot of that, it's like, how do you supercharge the networking and the referral base? Because that's where that specific niche is going to be successful. 
So you've done enough agency work and touched enough things that you can help clients, not only with a granular, but the actual strategy of getting them the right, the, all the right pieces in place. Is that what you, kind of what you do? Yeah, I'd say so. Like, you know, I differentiate myself on the strategy. I have a very entrepreneurial spirit. I also come at it from like an abundance-based mindset. So there's never a problem that I don't think can't be solved. Or, you know, a lot of times if you can just switch the lens and how you're looking at things, does that find an opportunity to turn something that could be a, a negative into a win? I like to tell people I have that understanding of like ground level boots on the ground, but also the bird's eye view and understanding how those pieces connect. And so, yes, to your question, I helped provide better, I help address the strategy and then the actual execution that, or it's like, Hey, if it's something I don't know, it's like, well, Hey, I know somebody who does know it, or I can find the answers or vice versa, but at least a lot of it starts there. For sure. And you, you mentioned your client that was paying an awful lot for SEO. It reminds me of, you know, both, both of us being in the digital marketing space, there's a high number of incidences that I'm sure we both heard of where people are paying out for this service that isn't really tailored to their needs. And it's, it's heartbreaking that there's so many agencies out there that don't take the time to really understand the client's business goals and create content and strategies that actually move the needle, but they're happy to send an invoice every month, <laughs> but what are they actually doing? So it's nice to find agencies like yours out there that work with clients to actually drive the results. I completely agree because then it's like you have somebody that has a bad experience, they get a negative taste in their mouth, therefore they think that the channel doesn't work. And then, you know, then it becomes like, well, hey, because of my experience bi biasness, do I completely exclude opportunity? And then does that now then become another lost opportunity cost? You see that in every vertical, there's always bad eggs, but ours is definitely ripe with it. It comes back to the intentions are good. But then when you look about it, again, going back to human nature, like the law of the conservation of energy, you know, most people are going to go through the least pathway of resistance. And so it ends up that despite good intention, you end up going through that route. And so it's like without a good strategy to help direct the ship, that work, you know, it just becomes busy work that isn't necessarily bearing any fruit. And you and I initially met because of your expertise in Google ads, which is something that everyone who doesn't love to do digital ads, which is most people in my experience, <laughs> yeah. myself, you know, would like someone like James to call up and be like, Hey, I got an ad campaign I need to do for a client. Could you help me out? So we met on that basis, but I've since learned that your passion for strategy and making all the pieces work together shines even more than your passion for Google ads. And so I'm just curious, I know you mentioned you had put together a strategy for a client that was very beneficial to their business. So why don't you walk us through what you did for him? So it was a, it's a drone operator in Arizona. Last year, I helped him double his business. And there was really a lot that went into our playbook. Or I mean, There was a lot of steps that got to the point where the, like, the strategy in the playbook has evolved to what it is now. John is the name of the owner. And then the company is called Desert Drones. And when I first started working with John, he had just started out. You know, I think he had maybe been in business for a couple months. When we first started out tinkering with ads because that's how we knew that he was starting to get some leads and get some visibility. And a lot of times that's the case, right? Because... People sometimes confuse when it comes to Google. In a world of instant gratification, the, the default mindset of going to SEO really also sets a you know bad expectation mindset from the client's perspective because it's not instant gratification. I constantly tell clients the steps that I take today, I don't expect to see the full result of that labor until three to more likely six months from now. So that's where it's like SEO is very labor intensive, ends up being very costly because of all the labor. But once you've built up that foundation, it's like the mindset, you know, brick by brick, my citizens, Rome wasn't built in a day. And so it's like, when you look at Rome, hey, look how glorious this is. We forget the pieces and the bricks that were laid along the way to get there. And so that was a lot of the challenge where we started. It's like, okay, you know, once the time when it comes in, it's like, hey, if we want to show up, test of certain keywords, because that's always going to be an important term in the Google sphere is, okay, like, let's actually see if there's merit in these keywords. And so for him, it's, where I also differentiate is like going after like the, what has the buying intent, right? Because again, if we go back to least pathway of resistance, it's most people might go after things that are easier to rank for, but why are they easier to rank for? They don't have the same monetary value. 
And so with John, what we ended up doing is like, okay, let's get your ads in place and then start working on your SEO. And that really looked at, you know, from like a multi-encompassing process, you know, first it started like, let's look at the website. And we kind of had a website that just wasn't very user-friendly. We ended up remaking that for him. And then at the same time, what really was the biggest catalyst of growth was actually looking at it from the local SEO perspective when it came to his Google business profiles. See, for John, where he was limited is he's based in Tucson, but he's able to serve, you know, most of Arizona because it's like, well, hey, this is my full-time gig. You know, really, it's only a couple hours to get here in between here and Phoenix. Where I really want to be is how do I get more jobs in Phoenix? So that's where I know the most opportunity is. And that, that really was the catalyst is we looked at it. It's like, how do we expand into a new market? And so what we ended up coming up with was a strategy of utilizing virtual offices to therefore get the Google business profile, encompassing then the three core components of Google, which is reviews, which I will tell everybody is the lifeblood of your business when it comes to Google, or really just in general, because you know you get a lot of like decision bias that consumers will make in reviews. Everyone knows reviews are important. If you're not, you're lying to yourself. The other one is then obviously the organic, which we know takes time. So it's patience, brick by brick, and then the ad side. So those are really like the three components of like how we look at it when it comes to SEO. Like that's how I look at it from the business. And so for John, it was okay. You know, we started with like, hey, we need another location because we're already running ads for the Phoenix area. But we're realizing it's like, you know, it just doesn't really convert as well as the Tucson area. And so that's really what kind of inspired, like, let's go find a way to get a virtual office open in Phoenix. Now, this is where a lot of the experts in the space will like pump the brakes. They're like, wait a minute, hold up, dude. Like, you know, you're not supposed to theoretically do that, right? Like Google frowns upon it. That's where I'm like, you know, rules are meant to be guidelines. Also, when you think about like, why does Google even have this like archaic rule for service-based businesses that you have to have a physical address for it to even populate our work, right? Because like for ads, you can't have your ad show up in the map results if you don't have an address physically visible, right? So that becomes a really huge hindrance to your ability to succeed on Google and to really get the most out of your ads if you don't have that core component. Another thing is Google has experimented routinely throughout its history, giving different ranking preference over if you're a service area business or if you have an address. You know, I remember back, you know, even I think it might've been last year or the year before, where if you were a service area business, you were getting penalized. Uh, you were had less likely chance to show up in the map results as is someone with a physical pin, right? Like, because again, when, when you think about like, what is the user experience? I'm going through the maps. What do I see? The pins, right? Like, that's how I show the relevancy in terms of what's adjacent to me. That's going to help drive a lot of that decision making. And so when you look at it from that limitation of like, hey, user experience, Google's really just trying to adhere to that experience. That's where that disconnect comes in. And so that's what really doubled down on the push, like go for the addition, like find a virtual office because one, it has to be cost effective. You know, I've, for instance, during the pandemic, a lot of businesses not having as many employees come into the office. There's an example where I know a property management company in Colorado, they have five locations and one of their prime locations that was valuable to them from an SEO perspective, they were paying like $2,000 a month in rent for this location. Nobody's going to this location. They kept it for over a year just because they're like, well, we know we get the monetary value out of having this location. So we'll stomach that, that, that cost of the lease. And then obviously any other additional costs that comes with having a building and running that and all that fun stuff, right? Just for that SEO value. And so it's really when you look at the, the way this, the game is set up, you know, it again pushes the virtual office, especially when you look at COVID where a lot of businesses, again, followed the same mindset. A lot of small businesses went there and push to that direct route. Like I've, you know, I've talked to accountants and CPAs that have done such, you know, so when it comes to like small mom and pop service based businesses, that's what reinforced pushing in that direction. And what's also interesting is that we've seen since doing this, people would say, you know, Google flags, like say Regis, which well known within the industry. But what's honestly been the most successful strategy is going for John is he goes and finds Regis locations and they're like under Regis. A, so it's like a brand of like, like co-working spaces. So therefore they're going to be on Google's radar because of that. It's easier. So like something like a small mom and pop, you know, you'll see like the solopreneur go in and open like a co-working space. I've seen that at least in my, in, in my city, those ones so you can fly under the radar. I've even seen, I have a great example of a gentleman who owns a pest control company. He's like, Hey, I want to be in this specific area. And he went and knocked on homeowners doors that had shops <laughs> and found a way. He's like, Hey, I, I will rent your shop from you. 
So I may I have this listing. Those are like some of the creative ways because it goes back to like, hey, that pump the brakes mindset, like you shouldn't do that. When you actually break down the black and white of what is Google's criteria for having a physical address or like a like an office, it's like it has to obviously be a unique address. So hey, a shop, it could be address 1A. You have to have business signage that's publicly visible, right? That's where I've seen even people do like a office space within an office, hence co-working, right? Like I can go say a shop that has like maybe a garage on it and rent that out and like from argument's sake, like who, who are you to say that, that that is not a legitimate address, right? Like, and again, then it's like the mindset's like, oh, well, customers are gonna go there. I'm like, that rarely ever applies. Like, I think of the one time I've ever been like, hey, I actually had a client show up to this address or if I'm using my home address, like show up to my home address. In the example, it was a boomer looking to come and drop off his payment via like check because that's just how that generation is, right? So it's like, why let that be a limit is like, hey, I'm not gonna use my home address or hey, I'm not gonna go find this, you, you know, this virtual office to like really get the advantage that you need to succeed on Google where it's like, hey, you know, Google obviously like they're gonna push ads like you continue to see how organics push down. So for organics, like the maps make all the difference. And so going back to John's example, opening up a location in Phoenix was the big driving factor from him, like more than two X, it was about two to three X in his lead volume in terms of like year over year. And that was a big catalyst for him to double his business year over year. And is the winning playbook that we've now used where he's like, Hey, how do I now franchise this in terms of like, how do I go find other drone pilots in other areas? Because desert drones, you know, he's in Arizona. Well, like you can go to New Mexico, you can go to Nevada. There's the desert drones mindset, like that branding can be, you can have a more regional sphere for that. And then also there's a, the added benefit going back to the ads. We were already running ads in Phoenix that more than cut his ad lead volume, the cost per lead, it cut it in half because he was able to show locally. So somebody is searching for an aerial photographer Phoenix, now I have the opportunity to show up in the text ads, the map ads, and the organic map results. The final piece I kind of bring this all together where we really also continue to double down on the virtual office location strategy was, we, hey, I want to start thinking of like owning Phoenix from a triangle perspective. I'm based in the north side now. How do I show up more on the west side where there's a lot of construction projects and developing, which is a good bread and butter for him because that's like more repeat business, higher ticket volume. But then also there was the east side. So he ended up easier to do on the east side because it's already established. So we ended up finding another location back in November for Mesa. We did nothing to that from an SEO standpoint. Like once we'd already built up some of the foundation from an SEO perspective, all he had to do was literally launch this new location and drive reviews to it. Within the first couple of months, it was getting double digit lead volume. We did nothing. That location, it cost him like $87 a month, right? So like that return on investment ends up being massive. If he only just gets one like job a month from that, that's like a five to 10 X per month. And it's like, you're already baking it into the, the system. And so that is the winning strategy that we used on Google. It's, you know, to really recap, it's you first start off with, do I have a Google business profile? If I really want to be on Google, I'm a local business. It's make sure my business profile is styled and dialed. If I want to know that I want to really start to invest in getting more leads in Google, it's I need to address my SEO and ads because all ships rise together. You could do one without the other, but the efficiency gains that we get from the ads while also having strong SEO, because now you have to think about it from the consumer's perspective. There's like the mere exposure effect. If I see something over and over again, I'm going to be more likely to recall that. So searching on Google, I see your ad, I see your Google business profile in the actual map results as an ad and organic. Now I've seen you three times. Now maybe I'm going and engaging with that. I see you have reviews. You're just increasing the likelihood that the consumer is searching for this problem. Wow, this person must be like the provider or the person to go to because I see them all over the place at that top above the full results. That was the playbook that we use and it's allowing him to continue to have a growth strategy because we got to a point where now you don't have to invest as much in the SEO. It's more of let's focus on the bigger lever, which is going after an, and going into a new market. Because after a certain point, and this is true to anything, like you start to hit a point in diminishing returns. I told John, unless we're doing a new launch, it doesn't make sense for you to continue to pay for SEO. Cause obviously again, going back to the fact that it's more costly, you know, continue to do your ads, continue to refine the strategy. It's looking at the business owner. Hey, I can help get you leads, but let, let, let's also look at the bottom line, right? Like that's always going to be important. So. Right. 
something that is easy to get lost in translation is the bottom line. When you get busy in the in the grunt work and all the um, all the the labor, as you mentioned with SEO, but keeping an eye on the prize of the bottom line, which is great. So it's great that you don't neglect that most key element for your clients, like John. <laughs> yeah, most people might like. Wait a minute, you're crazy. You're only gonna sit here and tell me to do it for this long and like just walk away from that cash, like. Sure. It's like at the end of the day, would I rather have somebody work with me longer because we're a partner in the sense that it's like, I'm not just here to treat you as another paycheck. Like, yes, there's obviously always that component. We're obviously in business and people are business owners because they want to make money and they want to get ahead in life and achieve their goals. But, you know, at the end of the day, how do I find somebody that I can trust that's actually going to try to think of like, I was in their shoes how and I had a finite resources because let's like what like true facts, like most small businesses, it's like time and the, you know, and dollars are always going to be in, you know, short supply. So it's like, how can I best leverage those? Yeah. Absolutely. Well, if someone is watching this and thinking, Hey, I want to take that winning strategy for Google and expand <laughs> to a new location or whatever, uh, how do they get a hold of you, James? Yeah. I would say just via email. It's easy to get up. You can find me on LinkedIn. That's a way to message me. You can text me at my number. We can drop that out. That's 360-909. 5772. Always open to reach out and say hello. I mean, I still need to launch my own website, which is always kind of funny in terms of the mechanic that goes home and drives a beater. And everyone's like, dude, do you know how to fix cars? Why don't you fix your own? You're like, hey, I want to go home and unwind. So I make it a little bit harder for people to find me. But that's also it's like, hey, if you really have the intent, and you really want to get those results. It, you know, the, you will put in that effort. I can come in and also do where it's like, hey, do I want somebody to do it all for me? Sure. But at some point, like you're going to always have to give feedback. I have clients like if I tell you, you need to focus on getting reviews and yet you fail to continue to ask for reviews, it's like my, I can only go so far, right? Like I can't be in the field with you and your customers to make you do these things, right? Like I can give you the steps and the playbook and the tell you how to implement it, but if you're not going to implement it. Oh, so it's a strategic move that you don't have your website up? I think it's more of like, it's just, it's the mindset that you know, as it continue to grow, make sure you don't fall behind on producing results. And it's just falling into that trap. And I'm like, at the same time, I hesitate. So I'm like, James, you're just telling yourself an excuse. So it's a lack of prioritizing it, but it's at the same time, like I've realized it's like, okay, it does make it easy. Like it, if someone really wants to work with me, they're going to know why, like, Hey, I either referred or I've seen you've gotten results. And it's funny. Nobody ever comes to me <laughs> because they saw me through a website. I don't need a website to be able to do what I do. Just to recap, was it a three or four uh, point tier of of the Google thing, of the, the steps to the strategy? The three steps are really simple. You look, when it comes to Google, you have to look at it as three components, reviews, SEO, and ads. Now, if I actually pull up a specific example for what we did, example of using Google, you see obviously running ads, most times, depending on like what type of search results, if you're, you know, you're experienced with yourself searching locally or on a phone, most of the time you're not going to see the actual organic. It's going to be ads and then it's going to go straight to the Google business profile. And as you can see here, we have Desert Drones. They show up at the top here as an ad. If you were to mostly see the organic side, you'd see, okay, here I see the ad in the maps. And then I also see that I'm ranking here organically as well. If we go a step further and look into the more businesses side, you know, say I'm actually engaging with this. This is where John was able to have his business location here. And then if we also go into Mesa, where we're again trying to triangulate, you see him over here as well. And so there might be certain instances where he might have both listings show up in the map results. And so how we did this was virtual office, drive reviews to that new location, do some supplemental SEO work, you know, things like citations, adding the address to the footer of the website, stuff like that. You can't just go and open an office and do this on your own without like at least making sure you're checking your boxes on the SEO perspective. And then we continue to run ads. And like that was really the playbook. It was, hey, if I want to expand into a new market or say we're even looking in an example of our local area where it's Portland. If I'm looking at Portland, I service Portland or I'm based in Portland, but I know I service Vancouver as well. I could potentially have a office location in Vancouver to get like this Northern hemisphere, maybe somewhere in like the Southeastern to kind of take this 
this part of the site, you know, like this area. And I would definitely be focused on the West side because obviously we know like that's where a lot of the money is. And so if I'm a business owner and I'm looking to expand into other areas or just try to show up more on Google, this would be even from like a more locally dense area and a you know, larger metropolitan area, like this would be the, the way I would approach that from the virtual office, Google, like owning the Google Maps by basically like, hey, if I'm thinking proximity, right, in this search Portland, where are these pins all registering in the heart of Portland, right? And so somebody that has an office location here for somebody typing in Portland, just given the way that Google actually puts in request and serves result, it would behoove me to show up or to have an office or a virtual office here. Same if I wanted to go somewhere in Beaverton, right? You know, you obviously can show tangentially being more centralized in the center of Portland. Because like, again, like now when you think of your circle of sphere, you, you're likely to show up and you're more tangential, like, you know, like a Beaverton or a type. So that is, the, that is the playbook. Well, awesome. So people should email you or call you, call text or send a yeah. message on LinkedIn if they want to show up more strongly on Google. Excellent. Well, thanks for sharing your time and expertise with us today, James. It's been very educational. Of course. Thank you so much for having me on, Summer. I appreciate it.